G'day, Chris here, and welcome back to ClickSpring. In this video, I make the user input section of the mechanism, the input crown wheel assembly. If I were to make the input crown wheel without any consideration of the existing artifact, I'd be inclined to start with a solid piece of round stock, machine the recess, and then finally cut the teeth. But during his investigation of the mechanism, the historian Derek de Sola Price noticed evidence of fine cracking around the perimeter of the wheel. A sure sign that this was yet another fabricated part, most probably using a cylindrical piece of metal for the interior, and then a thin metal strip formed into a band was either soldered or perhaps riveted to the perimeter. Now much like the main solar drive wheel, from our modern perspective, this is clearly not the easiest way to construct the part. So again, the question naturally arises, why did the maker choose this more difficult method? It's possible that it was due to the turning limitations of the period. And certainly, it's easy to imagine that forming a small recess like this might not have been entirely straightforward. But there are some other features in the device that would have been much more difficult to form, such as the very precise recess for the front dial calendar ring. So I'm not convinced that that was necessarily the reason. For now, I'll fabricate it as per the original, and hopefully the reason will reveal itself during the course of the build. Now for this fabricated approach to work, the brass strip needs to be formed into a reasonably accurate circular band with a slightly undersized inside diameter. In fact, it's just one of several accurate tubes that are required for the mechanism to function. From an engineering perspective, accurate narrow tubes would probably have been one of the most challenging aspects of the original construction, particularly if it's assumed that the maker only had access to flat sheet stock to begin with. For the short tube or band that I'll use to construct A1, I think a plausible suggestion is that a simple former was used, around which the sheet stock was wrapped and then lightly hammered into shape whilst heated. The tool is easily made, and I think it's conceivable that a set was made to generate a range of inside diameters. I'll develop this idea a bit further when making the concentric pointer tubes later in the build. For now though, I use the torch to repeatedly soften the brass strip and then slowly work it around the former taking care to reheat the work as soon as it started to cool down, and also being careful to not overheat it. It doesn't take much to melt a small piece of brass like this. A touch of soft solder bonds the two parts together and fills the join in the perimeter of the band. I'll be sure to position that join to coincide with the root of a tooth when I form the teeth later. 
and briefly dipping the part in soda ash neutralises the flux residue, preventing it from corroding the metal surrounding the join. The central hole now becomes the register to relocate the part back on the lathe for some cleanup cuts, matching the spigot turned on the face of this temporary arbour. The workpiece needs to be flipped so that I can make some cuts on the other end. But rather than risk loosening the solder join with heat, I soak the part for about a half hour in acetone to dissolve the superglue bond. Now at this point the wheel could be manually divided and the teeth hand filed as will be done for the rest of the mechanism. But the shape of this wheel allows me to show you something a little unusual. Wheel cutting on the lathe where the cutter passes through the work vertically rather than horizontally. Much of the process for regular wheel cutting still applies, but you'll notice that there are a few key differences. For one, the motor, speed control and spindle are all set up to travel vertically as a self-contained unit on the vertical slide. And the depth of cut is now measured along the length of the lathe bed, requiring something like a dial indicator to give a precise indication of that depth. Gradual increases in the depth of cut on either side of a single tooth eventually leave a small triangular land at the tooth apex. At which point the carriage can be locked and all of the teeth cut at the same setting. I took a light skim cut of the perimeter to remove the small exit burr left by the fly cutter and then marked out the rectangular hole that will receive the driving arbour. Of course I'd like these markings to remain after I've removed the part from the arbour. So that rules out using either heat or acetone to break the bond. But fortunately superglue is very hard and brittle when cured. So a third option, providing the part can tolerate the impact, is to simply tap it off with a hammer. And that's where I'll leave this part for now. Now you'll recall from a previous episode that I'd like to keep the whole structure open throughout the build to give you a good clear view of what's going on. So for at least the duration of the build, support for the input arbour will be provided by this bracket, pinned to the main plate. A key feature of the bracket is that crisp 90 degree bend which I formed by milling out a V-groove in the raw stock. And the easiest way that I've found to hold the work to form this sort of groove is by using a cement chuck on the mill. Now it does have its limits, but it's a surprisingly sturdy way to hold apart. And it also provides access to all four sides as well as the upper surface, making it easy to bring the perimeter to size using the single setup. And here's a closer look at the depth of metal remaining after the V-groove has been cut. I've found that around 0.4 of a millimetre gives a good tight radius to the bend and allows the metal to bend easily without cracking.
The inside corner of the indexing arm that I made in a previous video serves as a convenient square reference. And I'm being very careful here not to bend back and forth too much to avoid work hardening the join which would increase the risk of cracking the thin metal. A small bead of soft solder makes the join permanent and once again a soda ash solution neutralises the residual flux. Back on the surface plate I marked out the positions for the other bracket features. Now the issue of depthing the input assembly is a little tricky. I'll go into this in detail for the other wheels later in the series. But at this point of the build, I don't really have a convenient way to depth the crown wheel other than by using the device itself. The wheel assembly could be held up to be one with a toolmaker's clamp, depth, marked and then permanently fixed in place. But I'd also like to have the back surface of the bracket flush with the side of the main plate without having to trim that plate after the fact. So that meant making my best guess at the correct depthing at the planning stage and essentially locking it in at the start of the project. It was a riskier approach, no doubt about it, and as it happens it worked out fine, but I'll be taking a more traditional approach with the depthing for the rest of the mechanism. The lateral position of the assembly was determined based on the main bearing position, and I put in two witness marks on either side of the main plate. Aside from being useful right now, they'll record the centre line should I need it later in the build. With the input assembly position located, the bracket and underlying main plate were drilled out to accept a pair of steady pins.
The steady pins now ensure the accuracy and repeatability of the bracket position. And once clamped firmly, I drilled out the hole for the bracket retaining pin. A quick tidy up of the holes and that's the bracket complete for now. Next up is what I'm calling the driving arbor. The shaft that transmits the torque generated by the user through to the crown wheel. It has a nice straightforward profile that I formed on the lathe and that I use the mill to form the features at each end. And with that rectangular driving section now formed, I opened up the matching rectangle marked out in the centre of the crown wheel, taking care to ensure a close fit. With the crown wheel assembled on its driving arbor, I marked the retaining pin position which will ensure a small clamping force from the taper pin once it's inserted. The last items on the parts list for this episode are the retaining pin that holds the bracket in place and a small washer to protect the underside of the main plate. Okay, so that's everything I need for the moment. Let's put it together and see what we've got. The friction is quite low, with both wheels showing free and smooth movement. And the gear interaction feels good too, much better than I expected from a triangular tooth form. In fact, based on the feel alone, there's not much to give away the fact that it's not a modern tooth profile. In the next video, the mechanism will continue to take shape, as I make a start on the calendar and eclipse gearing. Thanks for watching, I'll see you later. Now if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to help me make more, then consider becoming a Clickspring Patron. As a Patron of the channel, you get immediate access to the Patron series of videos. This includes the five videos from the Wedge Style Hand Vice build, and at present, the first five videos of the Byzantine Sundial Calendar build. There's also the first three episodes of the new Tools Glorious Tools series, with more to come as that series progresses. And don't forget that as a Patron, you also get free access to the plans for the Patron series projects so you can follow along and build them yourself if you wish. Visit patreon.com forward slash clickspring to find out more. Thanks again for watching. I'll catch you on the next video.